All right, why don't we, uh, why don't we get started? Hello, everyone. I'm so happy that everyone's here. I wish I could say happy to see you, but um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is our, our first, uh, what I've been calling creative engagement that we've done since, um, since the start of uh, this new way of living. And um, we decided to wait till tonight to start it off because tonight is, would have been the opening for orphans. And we're all so incredibly saddened by the fact that we had to cancel the show, but opening nights are always a special night for us. So we wanted to hold on to that moment. And, and, and I'm thrilled that we have a special guest here and what a perfect person to launch uh, these conversations with which will hopefully be one of many, many conversations. We're joined tonight but with Jacqueline Goldfinger, um, who, as you all know, was the, is the playwright of Babel. We were so thrilled. And Jack, Jackie said that, may I call you Jackie in public? Please. I know Jacqueline's your- Please. Your, okay. Um, uh, when I was talking to, to Jackie during Babel, she said, well, this is, I get to be the first world premiere in your new space. And that is true. And I, I was so thrilled that that happened like that, that we were able to yes. be, be so value. Theater Exiles build on the history of doing world premieres and cultivating new work. And we have had Jackie as part of our studio exhibition, our new play development program for years until we finally found the right play. Uh, to be here, and it was so perfect that it, it it helped launch our new space. So, Jacqueline Goldfinger, thank you for also launching this new series of conversations that we're going to have with artists. So, thank you for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for doing it. I can't wait to see who your other interviews viewees are. I love the exile artists. Yeah. Oh my God, we have so many of them, and. The questions that I'm going to be asking tonight, for, I want to tell you a little bit about Jackie, just to make sure that you all know, but um, the questions that we're asking, and this is a, a short form, it's going to feel like a post-show discussion, and at a certain point, I hope that you guys join and ask some questions, um, but I wanted to filter the questions through theater exiles, uh, our, our core values, and um, so you'll, you'll sort of see some sort of resonance with that, but before we even start with my questions to Jackie, because I'm actually really anxious to hear the answers <laughs> to the, the, the questions, I just want to tell you a little bit about Jackie in case you, you don't know. Now, Jackie grew up in the rural South, and many people know her from her work on the Southern Gothic genre. And before Babel, there were a number of plays that she wrote in that in that genre, the trilogy, was it a trilogy, would you call it, or? It was, yes. What were the, what were the plays' names? It, it was The Terrible Girls, mm -hmm. Skin and Bone, and The Arsonists was mm -hmm. the Southern Gothic trilogy. Yeah. The, yeah, they're wonderful, wonderful plays. Um, she also, you may not know, works as a librettist. Um, many of you may know that she is also a teaching artist and a dramaturg, but, um, she, you're working currently on a musical, is that correct? Yes. You, you said the title of it? Yeah, a little bit about it? Absolutely, about the, the opera? Yeah. Yeah, I'm working with actually local composer, Melissa Dunphy, uh, Dr. Dunphy. Okay. I have to call her doctor now because she just finished her doctorate at Penn. And, and, composition. and just a point of reference who Melissa is, she did the music for Among the Dead for us. Yeah, she's brilliant. She works in all types of music, recently received her PhD in classical composition from University of Pennsylvania. Um, she's had pieces that have been performed around the world. And she came to me because she liked my plays. I loved her music. And she asked me to be her librettist on a new project called Alice Tierney, which I'm incredibly excited about. Um, Alice Tierney, that name may sound familiar to you because it's actually based on the life and legend of a famous Philadelphian named Alice Tierney who lived here before the Revolutionary War. Um, so it's so exciting that not only am I being able to write for Melissa and her gorgeous music, but also that we're going to be highlighting a woman from Philadelphia history who's really exciting. Well, that actually... Uh 
can launch into actually my first question for you because you're not from Philadelphia originally. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your artistic journey. Like I know you here. Sure. I, I consider you one of our own, but the truth is you have a rich history before, before us. Can you tell us where you're from and how you came to Philadelphia? Sure. Uh, we've been in Philadelphia about 11, almost 12 years now. We love Philly. Moved here for my husband's job. Knew no one, um, except that this is where the job was. So this is where we were going. And we just felt incredibly lucky that we fell into a community that embraced us and started to feel like home very quickly. But before that, I was born and raised in rural North Florida, just outside of Tallahassee. And I went to college in Atlanta. I worked in Sarasota. I worked um, across the United States until eventually in my early 20s, I got to LA. And I worked in the film and TV industry in my early 20s, which is the best time to be in LA because you can make all the fun mistakes. <laughs> and there are very few repercussions. Um, and then I was, uh, went down to San Diego and worked at La Jolla Playhouse as the artistic assistant there and later literary associate. So I got to work on incredible commercial projects like Jersey Boys is the most famous, but also Aaron Sorkin's Farmworth Invention and work on the commercial scene, which is a completely different type of theater than nonprofit. Um, and then I married Larry and he got a job here. So we moved here and we were expecting to stay two or three years until he could find a job in the city that we knew. And we liked it so much, we just decided to stay. So we bought a house and we're raising kids near Wash West. Um, and it's great. That's, that's wonderful. And so I mentioned one of the trilogies that, that you've done mm -hmm. that, that, that sort of rooted, uh, was rooted in the South. And definitely you could hear it in the language and the sensibility and the, and the characters. Um, how has the fact that you have had many places that you have called home affected your work as an artist? I think it's helped me to tune my ear uh, because originally um, when I was first starting out, I actually started writing plays without realizing I was writing plays. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I was, I always loved writing poetry and short stories and drawing when I was in elementary and middle school. And eventually all my short stories became almost completely dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed figuring out how to make the characters sound different, even though mm -hmm. you didn't have the he said, she said of a traditional uh, fictional narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had a wonderful English teacher who's like, you're actually not writing fiction anymore. You're writing something called a play. Mm -hmm. And she gave me a bunch of plays to read. And I was really lucky in high school that we had a high school that had a huge auditorium and nothing to do with it. And so they, <laughs> I mean, and you can always find actors anywhere in the world. Like you just say, do you want to get up in front of people? And they're like, yes. So we were able to stage our own shows in the auditorium at school, and it was great. Um, so it's, I've always kind of been moving towards playwriting, even when I didn't know it, but then having a chance to go to school in Atlanta, which has a flourishing theater scene and people sound very different. Uptown mm -hmm. Atlanta is very different than, you know, downtown North Florida. Um, and then in California and LA, where I've worked with a lot of different people, I feel like my ear has become attuned to a lot of different types of voices. So when people ask, how is it that you write so many characters so well? I think a big part of it is I've just traveled a lot and I've met a lot of people. I've also had the privilege of traveling internationally. And so I have a, I have a good ear for dialogue, but I also, um, understand where a lot of different types of people are coming from because I've heard them speak about their lives. And how has Philadelphia specifically influenced your work, whether it's the ear, what, what about it has, has drawn you? Or influenced you? Well, one of the things I love about Philly is we have a very diverse scene. So you can write almost any type of play and find a company that produces it. You know, and so I've been incredibly lucky to be able to make almost any type of play I want in terms of form and structure for any type of audience and theater makers and always find a place to stage it. And really that's the only way you get better. You have to see it on stage. You have to work with actors and directors and designers 
to, to really get better. Um, and so I think if I hadn't had Philadelphia, I would be at a loss uh, because I wouldn't have had an opportunity to, act, to work in so many different ways. Um, also, I think that my plays are a little more meatier now. Like they go for the gut more because Philly is such a phenomenal, gritty, go for the gut town. We're not going to be fucked with, which is something we've, my husband and I really loved about the city. And so I think my pol plays are much bolder and gutsier because of it. It's, it's interesting that you say that because I, I saw all of your, the Gothic trilogy, and that is the quality that I was really attracted to by those. Mm. And for some reason, it felt very gritty, almost Philadelphia-like, even though it clearly was not set here in any way, but it was that sort of scrappy, rough around the, the edges, tell you exactly what you think kind of attitude that made it feel resonant to Philadelphia, even though it was not of here. And I think it's definitely from Philly. I lived here a couple of years before we staged the first one, which was the Terrible Girls. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of, you see that come through all three of the plays stronger and stronger till you get mm -hmm. to the arsonists, um, which is, I feel really gutsy and takes big chances both with dialogue, but also with style and form. Mm -hmm. Do um, uh, I? I really, I really love them, and I thought that the thought that they were wonderful. Is there now? I'm going to jump ahead to the work that you just did on Babel, mm -hmm. which has a very different sensibility to it. I mean, the the characters are definitely more refined and definitely more controlled, and that was the environment that you put them mm -hmm. in. But do you feel that living in Philadelphia? influenced that play or how would you think it would have influenced? Yeah, I could not have written that play without having lived here. Um, I would not, I don't think I would have had the guts. Sorry, spoiler alert for anyone who didn't see the play. At the end, uh, Amanda Schoonover, who is an, another wonderful exile mm -hmm. legacy actress um, and just one of the best actresses in the city bar done, any theater company. Um, uh, at the end, she stabs someone with a pencil multiple times and has to come back and explain herself. And, and kind of the, the muscularity of that language comes, I was a little worried about it coming across as unfeeling. Mm -hmm. and, and Mandy was like, no, I think it's just gutsy. Like, she's kind of sorry she's did it, but she's not really, but she's really sorry she's going to get caught at it. Mm -hmm. um, and so... It, I think it, I wouldn't have had the guts to end that play the way that I did, which is not, not as, like, it's a much harsher ending um, than what I usually have on plays. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, honestly, probably one of the reasons that I was attracted to it and thought it was an exile play, because you really went there with that, with that ending and took the characters to the inevitable end. You get, you get very attracted to, I think you, it feels to me that you really get attracted to your characters. And For sure. I think you have to love your characters, even the horrible ones, mm -hmm. if you're going to write them well, uh, because you have to have some empathy. If you don't have some empathy mm -hmm. from where they come from, they're just going to come off like stock villains. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want people to have complex feelings about your characters and their situations, then you have to find in yourself the empathy for them and like them in some ways so you can communicate well, that. And, and, you've, and I feel like you also write for actors' voices. Do you, you get attracted to actors too? I do. I mean, I just have some actors I so love working with. Uh, this is Manda's, I think she's been in five plays now of mine, four mm -hmm. or five here in Philly. And, and they're also actors who frankly just get it. You know, it's like when you find the right voice for the right song, mm -hmm. right? right. It, it, they just get it intrinsically. And that is lovely. Do you think you'll ever set a play in Philadelphia? Ask Brett Mapp from um, our attendee. Oh, hi, Brett. Um, Probably, yes. I've actually, that's one of the reasons I wanted to do the Alice Tierney story with Melissa mm -hmm. for the opera, right. was that I had wanted to write a play about her, but I couldn't figure out the right way in. So when 
Melissa Dunphy approached me and she's like, I'd love to work with you as a librettist. I want to do something that is about Philadelphia. I'm like, let's talk about this specific story. And she had actually heard the story too, because you know she lives in the part of town where Alice Tierney used to live. So Alice's story is a little better known in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so it will, it will be a Philadelphia opera. We're really excited. Excellent, excellent. Glad to hear it, glad to hear it. Um, so do you think you'll stay here in Philadelphia? You've made this your home? This is our home. We've bought the house. We've yeah. done the things. We're not moving. It's too hard. I, I ask you that um, because one, as sort of inherent in theater exiles core values is the idea that the artist is, we're a member of a community and we are responsible mm -hmm. to our community. And we have a responsibility to, to um, to make our to do our part to make our community as best as it can be yeah. and as a playwright who is here but also you're working nationally i i'm curious how you feel what you feel your relationship is to the community and what you think your job as playwright is to whatever however you define community absolutely i mean one of the things i hope is that now that my work is going national and even international occasionally um, I'm able to take people with me, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Contemporary American Theater Festival that was going to do Babel this summer, but is going to do it next summer instead because they had to cancel this summer. It's a big Lort theater. Um, I sent, I sent an email to all my Philly actor friends who I thought would be right for the parts. And I was like, I can get you an audition in New York for this show. Do you want to come out and send a bunch of people up there to audition? That's so th my hope is that Yes, I, I like world premiering things here. I just prefer that because um, this is my home. But my hope is that as I go out into the nation, I'm not going alone, right. that, I'm take, that, that I'm able to help spread the wealth of Philadelphia's theater community around the country and give people opportunities they may not have had in the past. That, that is wonderful. And that's a, that's a great service to us as a community. And I, and I mean, you've worked all over the place. My impression is Philadelphia is special. Like we, I, yeah. I really feel like we love each other. Like we support each other as a community. And my impression is that's not always true elsewhere, but you've been other places. You've worked deeper into different communities. Do you, am I just self-deluded and just in love with my own city or is that true? I think it's true. I think Philadelphia is special because people do actually care for one another. It's not like a networking kiss on your cheek. Oh, it's so nice to see you fake bullshit. Mm -hmm. People come up and give you a big hug and they love you or they have a problem with you and they'll be like, what did you do? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, and I also think it's probably a, a sense because the Philadelphia theater community is so young. Like the fact is, is that there weren't a lot of theaters here, locally based theaters here until the regional revolution movement of the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we have so many founders and so many of our theater people grew up together, I think helps create this really special community where people know each other beyond their work. You know, people are taking care of each other's kids and they've raised each other in some ways artistically as well as people. Mm -hmm. And it just makes a really special stew. That's, that's great. Do you, um, and um, well, we have a question that I want to, um, mm -hmm. uh, that you want to ask in terms of, uh, okay, you said Babel, you dealt with genetic testing, you were playing with science. I know science is part of your life. It's part of your family's life. Yeah. And you did a lot of research on that. Do you have any insights or any thoughts about how, um, is that relatable to this, this uh, the coronavirus climate that we're in right now? Oh my goodness. Everything seems relatable, right? right? Well, so yes, my husband's a scientist. He's a research scientist here at Jeff. And um, so it's, I do have a lot of connections in the science community and we talk about it a lot. I think that one of the things that scares like the coronavirus scare does mm -hmm. is it makes people want simpler answers. And I think one of the uh, questions that we tackle in Babel is yes, you want a simple answer. You want to be able to be sure 
that this baby who's growing up is going to grow up this way or will get this or won't get that disease because of the way they're, they're genetically inclined. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is, is, I think we have to be careful about simple answers because mm -hmm. often the answers, they're simple because you're actually hurting someone else or oppressing someone else and focusing in on one community. So I, I think that it's, everyone needs to take all the precautions with coronavirus. It's awful, mm -hmm. but don't make, let it make us get so scared that we look for simple answers that may have bigger ethical and moral, moral implications. Thank you. I mean, I do think that that's uh, one of the things about genetic testing that is so enticing. Yes. Um, we, we feel like there's, I mean, we've relied on medical science. We, we are living longer, we're healthier, but how to draw the line, how to know what the line is, it's, a, it's almost impossible to know when you're in the middle of it and yeah. to know what goes too far. And so that's why we need artists and, and philosophers to help us round and then thank you denise for that question um i want to go back to the libretto because robert dever wanted to know if you could oh, talk yes. a little bit about the difference between the how you write for a libretto and an, for an opera versus a play absolutely so and i'm going to speak uh specifically um to opera librettos and not musical theater librettos or okay. cabaret librettos because those are also different forms Mm -hmm. People think they're not because it all has the word libretto in it, <laughs> but it's all different forms. For opera librettos, one of the things you want to find is you want to find a story that you can tell in broad strokes. Because the fact is, is that with the amount of singing that goes on and the amount of overlap and the often in the singer's voices, which is gorgeous, and one of the reasons we love opera and are moved by it, it doesn't allow for situational nuance in the storytelling at times. So you want to tell a story that um, usually is poetic because usually it's written, if not in verse, then at least in the specific rhythm, which makes it helpful for the composer to have a way in composed. Um, but you also want to write it so that if someone misses a line here or there, it's okay. Usually, uh, opera librettos are only about 30 to 40 pages long, even in a, if opera is three hours, because the libretto itself um, is repeated, right? They repeat different lines, the choruses come back, and often it's the composer who chooses what choruses come back, um, not necessarily the librettist. Um, now, I'm lucky, I'm friends with Melissa, and I've worked with her on other non-opera projects before. So for us, I, I'm in the loop of what do we think we're going to double? What do we think we're going to have come back? How do, what parts of the story are we going to make sure are very clear? What parts of the story does she need to have the singers sing uninterrupted so the audience can take the next stat, step in the journey with us? Um, but often what happens is the composers... Um, commission the librettist, so they pay the librettist to write a story that they've already created, and they have it a way they want you to write it often, and it's, and it's only 30 to 40 pages, as opposed to a play, where a play, I'm pretty sure everybody's going to hear every line. Um, I can make all the decisions about where the overlaps come, where they don't come, where entrances and exits are, um, and also a full length play Babel is 95 pages. Usually a full length play is 80 pages or above. Uh, so it's a lot, it's a very different type of storytelling. Um, but it's one that I love and I've, I was very lucky I, when AMC at the opera started, I don't know if y'all ever saw that, but Met Opera paired with the AMC theaters, mm -hmm. project operas. And yeah. those were the first operas I saw and they're great. And of mm -hmm. course, we live in Philadelphia, which is one of the hottest the opera cities in the world right now, between Philadelphia Opera and Opera Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, and Opera Philadelphia has an incredible international festival of modern opera every year. So in an interesting way, I don't know that I would have gotten involved with it. I would have enjoyed it, but I don't know if I would have gotten involved with it um, unless I lived here. Mm -hmm. I, do you... Um... Thank you, Robert, for that question. Uh, Desiree wants to know if this is your first libretto and do you have, uh, so is this an experiment for you and do you have a background in music? So it's my first full opera libretto 
I have written for friends. I've written lyrics, not lyrics, excuse me. I've written short librettos for choral works or cabaret works or so I definitely I've been dipping my toe in and out here and there, but this is my first opera, which I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm ready to take that step. I've done enough short pieces mm -hmm. uh, that it's time to do a full length. As, as my dad says, it's time to shit or get off the pot with this opera <laughs> thing. I'm like, thanks, dad. <laughs> That's good advice, right? Like you gotta take the next, you can't be afraid of taking that next step or you'll never get anywhere. That's right. Um, so I'm scared. I'm excited. Um, I'm elated. I get to work with Melissa and also Christopher Murto uh, from Oberlin Opera has been brought on to direct and Philadelphia dramaturg Julia Bumke is going to be doing the mm -hmm. dramaturgy. So a lot of good Philly folks involved, which makes me feel better about participating just emotionally. I feel mm -hmm. taken care of. Um, and I don't, I, I wish I had a background in music. I love music. Uh, my father's an amateur musician. So he brought a lot of music into the house when I was young. My husband studied uh, classical music for years and he plays with West Philly Orchestra now. Uh, he's written a lot of their music. So I've always had music around me. I am not per se musical. Unfortunately, I don't have that kind of ear uh, for sound, but I've loved being immersed in a world of music. Hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, I, uh, I wanted to shift the conversation just a little bit. Um, you've been writing for a while. You, you're, a, you're a young woman, and I want to know if there has been a change in, in your career as to how, how the world embraces you as a, as a female playwright. Absolutely. Uh, let me tell you, when, when I first started out and I was in, I really, when I, I went to LA in my early 20s, I really switched to film and TV for a while, which I think was good because it taught me that that's probably not where I should be. Um, but when I really came back to theater in my mid 20s, um, there was still a lot of, um, it's okay to not treat people well, and whether that's sexual harassment or that's, hmm. or, or that's some other way, that there was a feeling in some companies that like you pay your dues and you tough it out and all of us went through this and I never understood I'm like but shouldn't you want to make it better like if you went through this and it was awful for you maybe don't do it um so with as you know um challenging as some of the me too movement has been like I, you know I think there are shades of gray and good and bad things about that movement um, about the movement to em embrace pro different pronouns, all of these things. At the end of the day, um, I think the sum total is that we are creating a much healthier, respectful uh, community of artists that's still doing great work. Um, the idea that you have to suffer and be miserable to do your work is just untrue, and that's been proven over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I think it's great. I think the, the women coming into the profession today hopefully will be treated much better. Um, I found Philly, and maybe this goes back to what you were talking about, of it being a family, more of a family situation. It's much better in Philly than other places. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I hope we just keep moving forward. I think that's great. I mean, I just feel like there's just even back from when I was starting, just women's voices on stage as the, as the playwright, just exponentially more. I mean, if- Absolutely. If there's- uh, and, yeah. yeah, and I think the, if you look at the numbers, the Dramatist Guild does this report every five years or so about who is on being put on America's stages. Mm -hmm. The numbers are getting better if you just want to look at it in a quantitative way. Mm -hmm. um, it's, there's still not parity, but, yeah. but it's still getting better, which is great. Um, so do you have a favorite play that you have written? Um, Brett Mapp also wants to poke at you and find out. <laughs> that I have written? Yeah. Uh, Brett always asking the hard questions. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, because The Terrible Girls was the first play that I had fully professionally staged mm -hmm. by someone who was not me. 
Um, that has a special place in my heart. Um, the arsonist, because it was based on my father's experience with his illness, has a very special place in my heart. Hmm. Um, but actually, I always think that my favorite plays are the ones that I'm working on, the ones that are coming up. Probably, it's probably like that thing where you spend too much time with a good friend. No matter mm -hmm. how good that friend is, you need a break. Yeah. <laughs> I feel that sometimes with my plays. I feel that with Babel right now. I'm like, I know I love you, but we've been together a lot recently. Uh -huh. Let's well, chill. what are you working on? Um, so we're working on the opera, which is fun. Right. Um, I'm working on a new play called The Floating House, which is oh. going back to my Southern Gothic roots about two sisters who live in a floating house in the Gulf of Mexico. For those of you who don't know, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, right below North Florida, um, there are houses that were built on stilts in the middle of the Gulf mm -hmm. back when zoning wasn't an issue because there were no zoning laws. Um, and those houses have been grandfathered in, and so they're allowed to still be out there. So um, my next one is about two, two is a Southern Gothic play about two sisters who live in one of those houses in the Gulf as it falls to pieces around them, mm -hmm. and the water is rising because of climate change. And so one of the sisters is collecting any type of styrofoam and empty bottles she can find to 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 uh, tied to the bottom of the house with the hope that when the water rises too high, the house will just float, which is why it's called mm. the floating house. Um, so I'm excited about that one. Um, and I'm working on one called People of the Light, which is based on, um, it's an original work, but it's based on the traveling preachers during the Great Depression, hmm. um, which I find fascinating. Like, the mass hallucinations, like everything that happened during the Great Depression in mm -hmm. terms of the spiritual life of America is fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, it's really where the big evangelical movements got started. Um, it shapes a lot of how today, how churches and other religious institutions are treated by the government. Um, so, but I'm still doing research on that one. Well, good. Well, let me know when those scripts are ready to be read. I will. Well, um, I want to uh, I want to end with um, a question. You've heard me say this, and uh, you guys may have heard, seen me, or I've written it or said it. I believe that playwrights are the prophets of our time. There is something about um, a good playwright like you are, Jackie, who sort of feels the resonance uh, and the questions that need to be explored, and the plays sort of seem to emerge at the time when when it's time to really break open those those questions. This, as we've said, um, people have called this unprecedented times, but we know actually looking back in history, we've experienced as here in Philadelphia, um, pandemics and things, but it's been a while. History repeats itself. What is it that we need to know? What's the next question? What do you have to tell us, Jackie? What is, what is, uh, what is the future bring for us? I always like to start a play at a place where other people would end a story. Because I feel like if you start at someone else's ending and you're asking a question forward, mm -hmm. then you may be prophetic, but you're at least gonna be interesting because it's gonna be something that people probably haven't thought much about. So, um, I mean, looking forward, I think one of the big questions is everybody's talking about when it gets back to how it once was, uh, before the pandemic. And my question, um, I don't have an answer for it yet, but my question is, do we want it to be what it was or do we want it to be better? And what does that better look like in our community? Mm -hmm. Because we're going to have a real opportunity to remake things. Um, so much has fallen apart. So many values have shifted. It's, it's, yes, it's scary, but it's an opportunity, I think, to refine and improve what we had and move forward, uh, much like after the Spanish flu of 1918 or after World War II, when we have these massive international upsets, it gives us a chance. It's, it's scary, and I'm not taking that away, and the people who are suffering, it's awful, both health-wise, who've lost their jobs. Um, but also the other side of the coin is it gives us a chance to reimagine how much better our communities could be and take steps to get us there because we've shaken up the status quo and we've shaken up the foundations of all of these structures that we assumed were 
stable and forever. And they're not because nothing is forever. Nothing is forever. And I do think that's, that's good words. Um, that's good words for us to think about that. We take everything as an opportunity. In fact, Desiree, who was here today, was just saying to me the other day, it's time for us to, gives us a chance to think about how we want to proceed. Maybe we want to break out of a mold that we were in before and think of new ways of, of doing things, that we should take this moment, take, take every moment that we were faced with, no matter how awful it might be, as an opportunity. Absolutely. And, and I, I think that's really, it's good to think about that. And as, as actually you and I were talking about before we started, um, it's, it's been very hard for me to think about the past right now or to, to dwell on the sadness that this was supposed to be our opening night of a play that I really wanted to do. And we can't yeah. do it because we've been so in the moment right now. Every, every week there's been a new emergency. Every week there's been something new that we have to deal with. And we are learning the rules every week as we go along. But it is a good time for us to try and try and think about the future and, and take the unknown as a tabula rasa, a chance to create things that are new. That's really wonderful advice for us to, to think about, Jackie. Thank you so much for that. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions from the, from the house. Um, I was, uh, we wanted to keep this sort of short and sweet and something to think about. Jackie, thank you so much for sharing Babel with us, sharing your time now with us, giving us things to, to think about. And um, I wanna thank everyone who's here as well for marking this moment with us. Um, every time we're together is special to me and I miss being with people and, but knowing that we're gathering together and getting a chance to, to talk about ideas is, makes everything just, just that much better. So thank you all so much. And thank you all for being here and being part of the Exile family. We're gonna continue doing these. This was our, our test run. You're our guinea pigs. Um, and uh, so we'll be together more. Thank, awesome. you, so thank you, Deb. Thank you, everybody out there. Thank you.